Hello again. We've been introduced to the regulation of the cell cycle and to apoptosis, or programmed cell death. In this module, we're going to look more closely at the regulation of the cell cycle and at some more details of apoptosis. First, a closer look at diffusible factors that control the cell cycle at so-called checkpoints. The first chemical factor that controlled some aspect of the cell cycle was isolated from developing frog's eggs. Remember though that frog's eggs are quite large and easily observed through the light microscope. As meiosis I, the first division of meiosis, begins, the nuclear membrane disappears, a process called germinal vesicle breakdown. If the cytoplasm of an egg at the germinal vesicle breakdown stage is collected in a syringe, which is possible because of the large size of the egg, and then injected into an egg at an earlier stage, that is before germinal vesicle breakdown, the nucleus in the injected egg immediately undergoes germinal vesicle breakdown, prematurely starting its meiosis I. The conclusion from this experiment is that the oocyte in the germinal vesicle breakdown stage must contain a diffusible chemical factor that is able to induce meiosis in an earlier oocyte. Because this hypothetical factor initiated egg maturation, it was called the meiosis promoting factor, or MPF. MPF was easily purified from meiotic frog's eggs and shown to be, of all things, a protein kinase made up of two polypeptide subunits. The green subunit here regulates the kinase activity of the polypeptide shown in gray. MPF is a kinase because it transfers a phosphate group from ATP to other proteins. MPF is a convenient acronym because a similar factor was quickly found in metaphase somatic cells. Metaphase cells could be fused with other cells in other phases of the cell cycle. And in each case, the nuclei of the other cell would break down and chromatin would try to condense into chromosomes, as seen here for cells in G1 and G2, where chromosomal strands are trying to form after fusion with a metaphase cell. Even the chromatin of an S phase cell tries to condense, although strands don't really form, probably because the replicating DNA makes it harder to do so. We can conclude that a factor in metaphase cells can induce the onset of mitotic events in non-mitotic cells. Not only that, the factor is conserved in this example between rat and human cells. The factor turns out to be a regulated kinase evolutionarily related to the frog maturation promoting factor or MPF. The regulatory subunit of this mitosis promoting factor is called cyclin. Why is it called cyclin? Because this polypeptide rises and falls with each cell cycle. The kinase activity peaks at the same time as levels of cyclin peak. The concentration of the kinase subunit remains essentially constant throughout the cell cycle. It is called cyclin-dependent kinase, or CDK, for most cells, because it had to be bound to cyclin in order for the enzyme to be functional. Now imagine how you might measure cyclin and CDK, as well as the maturation or mitosis promoting factor activity over the life of a cell. Think about that for a bit. Now here's how cyclin acts to regulate MPF kinase activity. Watch the animation. Cyclin levels rise from low levels just after cytokinesis, accumulating and binding to CDK subunits, eventually reaching a threshold concentration as the next mitosis approaches. Only after reaching this threshold can mitosis begin. Now if a cell is disturbed or receives conflicting chemical signals from outside the cell, it might not produce enough cyclin, thereby delaying mitosis, in fact until the cell is ready. Regulation of progress through the cell cycle occurs at several such molecular checkpoints, each controlling activity ensuring the correct completion of a prior stage of the cycle. The cells of lower organisms use a single cyclin molecule to activate different CDKs, or cyclin-dependent kinases, at different cell cycle checkpoints. Those of other organisms make different cyclins to interact with different CDKs. What dividing eukaryotic cells have in common are similar checkpoints controlling similar transitions during the cell cycle 
and the fact that they control the cell cycle by protein phosphorylation. Here's the cell cycle of yeast, which uses a single kinase subunit called, in this case, CDC2. The active cyclin G1 CDC2 kinase allows the cell to enter the S phase to replicate their DNA. Imagine a cell that finds itself in a nutrient poor environment and somehow it senses that it hasn't reached the right size yet. That cell will not pass from G1 to S, another checkpoint. Likewise, if insufficient cyclin M is made, the cyclin M CDC2, the MPF if you will of yeast, will not reach its threshold level and the cell will not enter mitosis. And here is an illustration of cell cycle control in higher animals. We see S phase and M phase CDKs as well as S and M cyclins. We now know that there are even more checkpoints controlled by different cyclin and CDK combinations. This illustration from your textbook emphasizes that cells are not always dividing but that they can be stimulated to do so. Signal molecules that can induce cell division are called mitogens and include hormones, growth factors, and cytokines. Hormones are defined by the fact that they travel from endocrine organs through the vascular system, that is through the blood, to target cells, to target tissues, to target organs. Growth factors and cytokines differ from hormones in that they are often signals passed directly from one cell to another without ever getting into the circulatory system. You're looking at an example of a known signal transduction pathway that starts when a mitogen binds to a cell surface receptor, initiates a phosphorylation cascade that then activates a number of cyclin-dependent kinases. These in turn phosphorylate the RB subunit of a transcription factor that represses several genes. Now RB is the retinoblastoma protein found in fact in all cells but originally associated with a mutation causing eye tumors, hence the name retinoblastoma. The RB protein is the inhibitory subunit of a transcription factor. When it's phosphorylated, it dissociates from the DNA binding subunit of that transcription factor, which can then turn on some genes. You can think about what kinds of genes might actually be turned on by the action of a mitogen, by the action of this transcription factor binding to the promoter regions of several different genes. What kind of genes could be turned on in this way? The demise of cells is not always accidental. In fact, much dying of cells is by design, a predestined stage in development. As you can imagine, this kind of programmed cell death or apoptosis is tightly controlled. Non-dividing cells are arrested in G0, the diploid state, before entering another S phase before their DNA can be replicated again. In fact, most mature differentiated cells stop dividing altogether after differentiation. So cells don't divide indefinitely. But they also don't live forever. When they die, they can be replaced by stem cells. As an example, our red blood cells function even without nuclei for about 60 days before they're then removed by the spleen. They're constantly replaced by stem cells in our bone marrow. In the next few slides, I'll focus on apoptosis or programmed cell death. As for the old saying that death is a part of life, that's nowhere more true than in the cells of an embryo. Here is an analogy that might be useful if you have ever seen workers pouring a cement sidewalk. First, a set of wooden forms is laid out in the pattern of the eventual cement squares of the sidewalk. Next, cement is poured into each of the forms and allowed to set, and after the cement has hardened, the forms are removed and the sidewalk is finished. Think of the wood forms as embryonic cells that were created in the embryo to guide the formation and location of subsequent cells in the embryo. Once their job is done, however, these cells have to undergo a programmed cell death, in other words, apoptosis. Another example of programmed cell death, perhaps one that's familiar, is metamorphosis, in which tadpole or caterpillar cells die to be replaced by frog or butterfly cells. Like many other regulated cell activities, apoptosis starts with an external signal. This diagram from your text is shorthand for a signal transduction pathway that generates a transcription factor. The transcription factor, in this instance the yellow triangle here, activates BCL2 genes 
that lead to the synthesis of BCL2 proteins. For the frog, metamorphosis results from the activation of genes initially stimulated by, of all things, thyroid hormone, which actually gets inside the cell to deliver its message. Now let's look at how some BCL proteins work. The BCL2 family of proteins includes BAX and BAC. These two proteins interact with mitochondria to form a channel through which cytochrome C can diffuse out of the mitochondrion. Recall that cytochrome C is part of the electron transport chain oxidizing carbohydrates and fatty acids in mitochondria. After leaving the mitochondrion, the cytochrome C combines with a cytoplasmic adapter protein, shown here as the green notched box in this cartoon, and the activated adapter proteins now associate with each other and with multiple procapsase proteins. The procapsase proteins are inactive proteolytic enzymes. These proteins are then hydrolyzed themselves, releasing active capsases. Capsases X, Y, and Z are enzymes that now catalyze the hydrolysis of cellular proteins, leading to death by apoptosis. Okay, cells often die because they're programmed to die. What about the unanticipated or accidental or unprogrammed death of cells, say from injury or illness? How can we tell the difference? Well, non-apoptotic cell death is called necrosis and is characterized by the disintegration of the cell, the lysis, the spewing out of the contents, as shown in the micrograph on the left. Apoptotic cells don't lyse, but instead they usually shrink and contract and their contents become more concentrated and the cells themselves can eventually be found engulfed in phagocytic cells where their molecular components are going to be recycled for their nutrient content. And that brings us to the end of this module.